This program contains dramatizations. All scenes are from original European records and Native American oral histories. The Great Northwest. America! The North Pacific was one of the last areas of the world to be opened up by Europeans. We are not supplied with provisions to keep us through this winter. Russians push south from Alaska. Spanish forces press north into California. We have all of these sailing, trading, trapping superpowers converging. As to the suspicions that the Russians want to colonize Spanish territory, dismiss from your mind this erroneous idea. Fur and gold. A mad rush for the last wealth of a vast continent. The conquest of the Northwest. After another, the Russians fell victim to scurvy. Several of them were covered with sores. Conditions at the settlement became more critical with each passing day. George Heinrich von Langsdorff, a German. He's the only doctor in Russia's Alaskan colony. To cure scurvy, he must have fresh fruit and vegetables. <coughs> Mr. Rasanov developed a plan for a new expedition to be undertaken in order to procure fresh supplies. Grand Chamberlain Nikolai Petrovich Rasanov. He has come to inspect the Alaskan outposts. He finds disaster. settlement is almost 2,000 miles south, a six-week sail from the Russian colony into enemy territory, Spanish California. To get supplies here will require a confrontation between two competing empires on the brink of war. The story of this international face-off begins almost 100 years earlier, when Russia first decides to encroach on Spanish territory. Russia was uh, playing a catch-up game with the other great powers of Europe. Russia was the least developed of the great European powers in terms of its economic development, its social development. Peter the Great was the uh, Russian ruler, the emperor, the Tsar, who put Russia on the map of uh, competition for empire, you might say, with the other great powers of Europe. For Peter the Great, naval technology is the key to competing with powers like Spain. Tsar Peter builds a new navy and a new port. He urges everyone in this new capital city to have a boat. And he lives part-time on his own. Peter was interested in knowing whether or not Asia and North America were connected at any point that hadn't been demonstrated at that time. He was interested in knowing how far Spain's empire stretched northward in, in North America. Peter's plan for dragging Russia out of the Dark Ages includes importing foreign scientists and naval officers to teach Russians the ways of the modern world. He chooses a Danish sea captain to lead a Russian naval expedition to America. Vitus Jonasson Bering, a 47-year-old Navy veteran from Denmark. He has come to Russia looking for career advancement. He will spend the rest of his life looking for the American Northwest. Bering and the Tsar toast with Peter's favorite drink, anise-flavored vodka. Charts and information about maritime exploration by Europeans were the atomic secrets of the day. It was a fight of territory, fight over trade, and so on. Bering's mission will take Russia to the edge of Spanish territory in the New World.
Bering's expedition of discovery will be the largest and longest ever mounted. Over 3,000 men and women take part in an overland journey of some 6,000 miles, 10 time zones, across Siberia to the Pacific, lugging materials to build the ships they will sail in. Bering makes this trip not once but twice, taking 16 years. Part of his orders are to map the eastern reaches of Russia's empire as he goes. Bering spends four years building ships and a new seaport in Kamchatka from which to set sail for America. Bering heads south by southeast, his best guess as to the direction that will take him to the American continent quickest. Ironically, Bering is following an arc just south of the Aleutian Islands without knowing it. We often saw species of seaweed, and sometimes a great quantity at once floating from the north, an unmistakable sign of land. George Wilhelm Steller, 32 years old, a German doctor and naturalist. Whenever I presented such unmistakable signs to the officers, with reasonableness, the greatest modesty, and patience, and advised them to adjust the course northward to get us all to land sooner, the officers thought it ridiculous to accept advice from me, since I was no seaman. He was not a member of the crew, and he didn't understand anything about sailing. Remember, there are no charts. They're sailing in, uh, on non-charted waters. Steller is eager to be the first scientist in a land unseen by Europeans. His journals are filled with frustration. Seafarers on voyages of discovery generally endeavor to pay attention to all details and to profit from them. But for us, the plainest signs were put out of sight and thrown to the wind. As the captain commander's personal physician, Stella shares a cabin with Bering. I believe errors concerning the distance between the continents may have crept in from excessive cockiness. Bering's ship continues on a northeasterly arc for five weeks without sighting land. The crew's initial optimism fades away. The ship's supply of water is more than half gone. They must turn around. But Bering and his officers decide to spend just a few days looking due north, the course that Steller has been urging them to take. at sea, running low on food and water, the Russian expedition of Vitus Bering finally finds North America. It can be easily imagined how happy we all were when we finally caught sight of land. Everybody hastened to congratulate the captain commander. However, he not only reacted indifferently, but in our very midst, shrugged his shoulders while gazing at land. Later, in the cabin, he spoke to me. We think we have found everything. And many are full of expectations, like pregnant windbags. But what they do not consider is how far we are from home and what accidents may yet happen. We do not know this country. We are not supplied with provisions to keep us through this winter. Winter comes early at this latitude. Even though Captain Bering has spent 16 years and come 7,000 miles to find Alaska, his concern now is the safety of his men and finding fresh drinking water for the long, cold trip back to Kamchatka. 
The ship's naturalist, however, has come to study America's flora and fauna. And apparently we have come all this way to deliver American water back to Asia. Have you already been on this island to make sure that there are no natives waiting to skin you alive? I have never acted like a woman, nor do I see any good reason why I should not be permitted to go ashore. To do so is to follow both my profession and my duty. The captain grants Dr. Steller's wish to accompany the water detail for just a few hours on shore. Steller collects several new plant species and gives his own name to some strange new animals, some of which will soon be hunted to extinction, like the giant Steller sea cow or northern manatee. He also sees evidence that this island is inhabited. I sent word to the captain commander and asked him to let me have more time. After approximately an hour, I got the answer. I was to get on board pronto or they would leave me stranded. Baring has completed his primary mission, charting the route to North America. Now he follows the Aleutian Islands west toward Kamchatka in fear that autumn storms will soon block his trip home. And there is another worry that plagues all navigators in the age of exploration. Scurvy. The first sailor falls ill one week into the return voyage. Six men die. Soon, the ship is without a captain, as Bering joins the list of men at death's door. In the mid-1700s, doctors are beginning to guess that bad diet breaks down soft tissues, ruptures blood vessels, loosens teeth. But without fresh food, Dr. Stella is helpless. Bering's ship is halfway home when the dreaded autumn storms hit. November 6th, 1741. Shipwrecked on an unknown shore. Steller finds edible plants and animals. A blue fox came and before our eyes took away our food. The very first instance of so many future tricks and thefts. What do you think of this land? Are we in Kamchatka, Doctor? It does not look like Kamchatka to me. The abundance and fearlessness of the animals alone indicates that we must be on an uninhabited island. A month after the shipwreck, Vitus Bering is dead. Over the next eight months, 20 more men die here of exposure and malnutrition on what will become known as Bering Island in the Bering Sea. Even before they could be buried, the dead were mutilated by foxes. That even dead attack the sick, still alive and helpless, lying on the beach everywhere under the open sky. The fur of these hated Arctic foxes is worth its weight in gold. 
The sea otters are equally plentiful and their pelts even more valuable. If only there were a way to get them off this godforsaken island, to sell them at market. The survivors find a way nine months after the crash. Under the direction of Lieutenant Sven Voxel, they rebuild their boat from the wreckage of the old one and sail west. They soon find Kamchatka. When they are leaving, Voxel says every crewman is allowed so much baggage. You want to take sea otter skins two apiece. Steller demands extra space and takes over 300 sea otters. So it isn't Bering's men that come with riches. It's Comrade Steller. In Kamchatka, people are amazed to see the survivors of Bering's lost expedition and what they bring, a fortune in furs. The survivors draw treasure maps of the Aleutian Islands and Alaska, showing the way to great wealth. The reaction is the sea otter rush begins. It was almost immediate then that uh, Russian fur traders began to organize expeditions into the Aleutians. came to Alaska, they discovered a culture or a series of cultures in the Aleutian Islands who had been hunting sea mammals for thousands of years. The Russians call these people Aleuts. These people were remarkable for a number of their skills. The women made these outfits for their husbands out of bird skins and intestines of marine animals so that they were virtually watertight. And the men were consummate marine hunters. When the Aleuts hunted, they would use spears instead of using a rifle. When you shoot an animal, you destroy a part of his fur. With a spear, you get one small point in it, and you can sew those shut. The Russians were not good sea otter hunters. Uh, that's why they relied on these people to work for them. As Russians move east, they encounter a different people, known as Alutic, but they treat them all the same. What was typical for the Russians to do was they would come into an area, immediately find out who was in charge, and take their children. You don't listen? Well, guess what? We can do whatever we want with your kids. So they would say, we want you guys to go out and do for hunting. There were several uprisings in the Aleutian chain. They all used to sit in their head up. They went and they dispatched several of the Russians, and then the Russians came back and retaliated even worse. What can you do? You don't have muskets like they have. For more than two decades, the Russians keep this lucrative source of furs to themselves. After 20 years of secrecy, a Spanish ambassador in St. Petersburg learns that there are Russians in America. The Spanish claim the entire west coast of America as their own. The next move will be Spain's. Seventeen sixty-five. Russian fur traders have been moving east and south along coastal Alaska for almost 30 years. The Russians tried to keep it as uh, much a secret as possible for as long as, uh, as they could. Now, King Charles III of Spain hears about this activity on his colonial doorstep. In order to secure the coastline for the Empire of Spain, which had claimed, of course, all of North America, what they did is they combined their forces with the Mendicant Order of the Franciscans to establish a set of colonies along the coast, primarily to defend the coast from uh, the creeping influence of the Russians coming down from the north. The newcomers are greeted with curiosity at first, but it soon turns to resentment. These padres would beat themselves on the back, they had scars all over their backs, and then they would do things that offended the Indians very much, like pointing their fingers at them. Now, this is something that only witches did in Kumeyaay society. 
The first Spanish missionaries arrive in San Francisco in 1776. They come with soldiers and settlers six days before the signing of the Declaration of Independence on the other side of the American continent. That same year, England's greatest explorer departs for the Pacific Northwest. Captain James Cook. At age 46, he has already completed two voyages around the world. The English knew that the Russians were in Alaska and part of Cook's mission was to find out how far they progressed. Captain Cook notes in his ship's log that there are Russians all along the Alaskan coast. To judge from the great subjection the natives are under, the Russians must have been here for some time. Cook's men pick up sea otter furs and trade with the natives. The sailors use the furs as doormats and blankets on the rest of their voyage. On the way home, they make a stop at the Chinese markets in Canton. In Canton, they discovered the Canton prices. A single fur will pay a sailor's salary for a year. Several of Captain Cook's sailors will soon lead their own voyages back to Alaska, seeking their fortunes. Word spreads, and within a few years, British, American, and French ships are all cruising the northwest coast for sea otter furs. By 1803, the Americans are looking for new ways to get in on the action. President Jefferson commissioned Lewis and Clark to find a water route through the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Northwest where the United States could participate in this fur trade. At the same time, far to the north, the Russians are fortifying their Alaskan settlements. The sea otter rush started by Vitus Bering's crew 50 years earlier has now become a state monopoly, the Russian-American Company. In the fall of 1805, a company official arrives for an inspection. His High Excellency Grand Chamberlain Nikolai Petrovich Rezanov, age 40, recently widowed. He was a man of influence in St. Petersburg. He wasn't the head of the Russian-American company, but he did have connections. Rezanov travels with his personal physician, the German doctor George von Langsdorff. Alexander Andreevich Baranov, 59 years old, general manager of Russian-American company activities in Alaska. Baranov, very complicated man, of vast intelligence, relatively low social origins, but who shared the vision of conquering a North American continent. Baranov has married the daughter of an Aleut chief, even though he is already married in Siberia. Baranov's Aleut wife will bear him two children. Their method for solving the labor problem really was to grow a new class of people called the Creoles. and of the Aleuts or the Clinkets. If you did take a woman, you wanted to marry her, you had to pay the dowry to the family. The Russians weren't doing that, they were just taking the woman. So that was one of the many problems building up that was causing the contention. By the time of Rezanov's visit, 
Russians and Klinkets have already had two major battles for control of Sitka, or as Russians call it, New Archangel. When they set up their New Archangel, as they call it, the capital of Russian America, they fortified themselves because they knew their lives were still in danger because we were still out there. We made life miserable for them. under siege in their remote fort, conditions are turning desperate for the Russian settlers. <coughs> A supply ship never shows up, and the men are starving. to save the Russian colony and perhaps his own life. He sails south to the nearest location certain to have fresh food. Enemy territory, the Spanish settlement at San Francisco. The Russians will either be allowed to trade for food here or die trying. A ship in San Francisco Bay loaded with starving, scurvy-ridden Russians from Alaska. They have come to enemy territory for food. Everyone is very nervous. The ship has come in, it's obviously armed. The Spanish had a security concern and it was justified. If you're the Spanish governor in Monterey, you have a very small garrison ships coming in from a foreign power, they could very easily overwhelm your garrison, and you would be very hard-pressed to get them out. It was a delicate situation, and he was on the forefront of this, this negotiation, and you don't want to give away the fact that your colony is very weak. Once Rezanov proves he is no threat, he is brought to the San Francisco Presidio. We were overwhelmed by the cordial reception of the hospitable family of the Commandant, and what followed was an invitation to dinner. A horseman is dispatched, taking news of the Russian visitors to California's governor in Monterey, 100 miles south. Rezanov must wait for the governor to arrive. But even the governor may not be able to grant Rezanov's wish. Grain and other food for the Russian colony. The primary problem was the Spanish weren't allowed to trade with any outsiders. They didn't want the colonies to go setting up their own independent systems. That would tend to break imperial control. While awaiting the arrival of the governor, we made daily visits to the residents of the hospitable Arguez and soon became on intimate terms with them. Loveliest is Doña Concepcion, the universally recognized beauty of Nueva California. I distributed fitting and valuable presents, thus displaying every evidence of wealth and demonstrating our generosity. The excellent climate of Nueva California was an hourly subject of conversation among the members of our crew. We noticed their inclination to remain here permanently and took the necessary precautions against their desertion. Rosanna posts guards to watch his own men. In spite of every precaution, two of our most esteemed men, Kalyanin and Polkanov, seized the opportunity to escape. 
possible it was a ruse for the purpose of collecting intelligence with regard to the bay. It gave Rezanov an excuse to send out boats looking for them. The boats just happened to be carrying officers who were charting the bay because the Russians had no idea what might happen. They indeed could end up at war with the Spanish. But you have this period, early 1800s to 1814, there was one individual marching through Europe. His name is Napoleon. What is happening in Spain? Spain is under French occupation. A week after Rosanov's arrival, Governor Arriaga comes to San Francisco from Monterey to talk business. Spanish soldiers escort Rezanov to his meeting with the governor. Have you heard whether permission has been granted to sell us grain? I must answer you in confidence. Previous to his leaving Monterey, the governor received information from Mexico that Russia may be joining Russia and Great Britain in a coalition against Napoleon and therefore Spain. If we are not now at war with Russia, we soon shall be. Your colony has many needs, as do ours. Both our needs could be supplied by mutual commercial intercourse, and our coasts will always be equally protected by both powers. As to the suspicions, long entertained by the court of Spain that the Russians want to colonize in Spanish territory. <laughs> Dismiss from your mind this erroneous idea. I can assure you that even if California were given to us on account of the expense of keeping it, we would not take it. Yet, we need grain. I came here to negotiate a purchase and I respectfully ask that you decide speedily in the matter so that I shall not lose valuable time. The latest news I have received from Europe is that relations between Russia and Napoleon are not amicable, nor are they amicable with powers allied to France, such as Spain. Perhaps. I wish you success, senor, but I am afraid that at any hour I may receive a report of a total breach of concord between our governments. This may be so, but you will acknowledge that you and I are at present in such an out-of-the-way corner of the world that we may hear of a war when peace has already been declared. You take this too lightly, my friend. <laughs> Men like us, who are inured to all kinds of dangers, must not take much notice of rumors. While Rozanov negotiates with the governor, Longsdorf is exploring the area's natural wonders and learning what he can about the Spanish mission system. At the beginning, Indians were not coerced to come into the mission. Uh, they simply wanted to baptize them. And so, so it begins as a very slow and gentle process. But working in parallel with their missionary efforts was the increasing spread of diseases, which meant their epidemics were breaking out everywhere the Spaniards went. Once the, the Padres came, they came with stock animals, with chickens, cows, horses, mules. These animals gobbled up the native food supply. Every village close to that mission would very soon be absorbed into the economic system because there was nothing else to eat. The missionaries who came to California from the uh, Order of St. Francis came here oftentimes to create God's kingdom on earth. But if you think about it, these men who have taken vows of poverty are living like princes in Europe. They have thousands of Indian laborers working for them for nothing. You know, the old saying is, uh, they came to do good and they did very well. Governor Arriaga does not have authority to sell Rezanov grain for Alaska. He must wait for approval to come from the Viceroy in Mexico City. Rezanov, meanwhile, develops a plan to speed up the slow machinery of government. A 
associating daily with this beautiful Spanish senorita, I could not fail to perceive her active disposition and overweening desire for rank and honors, which with her age of 15 years made her alone among her family dissatisfied with the land of her birth. California is a beautiful country, with a warm climate, an abundance of grain and cattle, and nothing else. Russia is a colder country, but abounding in everything. I would like to live in such a place. Rosanov's dangerous game has been set in motion. Now he must meet the governor and Concepcion's parents to play his trump card. 1806, Russian Grand Chamberlain Nikolai Rosanov is in California trying to get food from the Spanish to save his starving Alaskan colony. He will now put a bold plan into action. I have frankly told you our Russian outposts need grain. We could procure such produce in China, but uh, New California being nearer to us and knowing that you have a surplus that you cannot sell, I have come here to negotiate a trade which will be of mutual benefit. I still cannot give you an answer with regard to trade, senor. You cannot imagine how strict the regulations prohibiting all trade are enforced here. I have a proposal. You will not and cannot trade with the Russian governor, but will you trade with a member of the Arguello family? If Commander Arguello would graciously agree to allow his beautiful daughter to become my wife, The man was a sexual pervert, and he liked very young girls. He liked young girls? He's looking for a wife. As she looks at him, what does she see? He's Chamberlain to the Tsar. That's a catch. That's one of the finest courts in all of Europe, and she's going to be a lady of that court. He looks at her, what does he see? She's the goddaughter of the governor. He sees the possibility of an alliance between the two powers. You know about this, Concepcion? You wish to marry this man? My proposal was a shock to her parents, whose religious upbringing was fanatical. The parents forced their daughter to church and had her confessed. They urged her to refuse me, but her brave front finally quieted them all. The holy padres decided to leave the final decision to Rome. He's Russian Orthodox, she's Roman Catholic. This will require a dispensation from the Pope. Six weeks after coming to Northern California, Rizanov has finally procured flour, beans, peas, and corn from the Spaniards. Concepcion gave Nikolai a locket. That was the betrothal gift. The marriage contract estimated his return at three years. So he had signed a document in which he bound himself to return. And the letters he sent to the Tsar indicated he was going to return. Four months after leaving to get food, Nikolai Rosanov returns to Alaska. He drops off his precious cargo on June 8th. He leaves 16 days later, arriving in Kamchatka in September, then continuing on the long, lonely road from town to town toward St. Petersburg. Five months after leaving Alaska, he is halfway through a 6,000-mile trek. He falls ill several times, and my guess is it's pneumonia. And he gets back up on his horse, and he fainted. The horse kicked him in the head, and he died of a concussion. 
When the locket is found, it is sent back to its rightful owner. But five years later, Concepcion has not received the locket or any news about her fiancé. Trade relations between Russia and Spain never materialize. The Russian-American company decides to simply take what Spain is unwilling to sell. Ivan Kuskov leases land from the Kashaya Pomo tribe 100 miles north of San Francisco in order to start a Russian settlement. What California offered was a much better climate, more fertile soils, and a, an abundant, uh, rarely touched sea otter population that was just waiting to be harvested. I can only imagine the reaction in San Francisco when they began seeing native Alaskans hunting in San Francisco Bay. That might have been the first clue that there were Russians on the coast here. There was a party sent to investigate, and they came up the coast, and they came to Fort Ross, and, and they talked to Kuskov. And from the beginning, Spain told the Russians, but you're not supposed to be here. This is ours. But the few Spanish soldiers stationed in San Francisco can't hope to overcome these fortifications. Russians and Spanish must find a way to be neighbors in California, even if their motherlands are at war. In the course of the meeting, the commandant of Fort Ross hands back the locket that Concepcion gave Nikolai as a betrothal gift. Young men, anyone who was available, is lined up out the door trying to court her. She becomes a member and wears the robe of the Franciscans. She never took another man. In the 1810s, the Napoleonic Wars are tearing Europe apart, but creating opportunity for New World colonies. Since the Spanish government is so weakened in Mexico, the movement for independence is brewing. The Spanish could not handle being stretched so thin. Spain loses all of its colonies during the time of the Napoleonic War, or immediately thereafter. By 1825, California has become a territory of the new Republic of Mexico. Spain no longer has a presence on the North American continent. Russia's days in America are also numbered. The sea otter population has been decimated. With expenses outweighing revenues, the Russian-American company pulls out of California in 1842. Six years later, California is part of the United States, and gold is discovered 100 miles east of Fort Ross. Within six months of the initial gold rush being announced, there were hundreds of abandoned sailing boats. In San Francisco, this fledgling new American town, everybody abandoned ship and went to the gold fields. It was nothing but chaos. It was a brutal frontier. Before gold was discovered, there were 12,000 non-Indians in California. Now, just four years later, there are 500,000. And the Indian population has been cut in half by war and disease. The expedition of Vitus Bering discovered a wealth of sea otters in America, touching off a race among European superpowers. But it was the California gold rush that finished what the sea otter rush had started, the conquest of the last corner of America, the Pacific Northwest.